This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And I want to give a special thank you to Pierre Friquet, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Pierre writes, Greetings, Earthlings. I am happy to be patron number 202. I've been following you for many years, and only now have I done a galactic jump to support the show. When I trekked through the French Alps and walked 450 miles in a month, Geek's Guide to the Galaxy was my best companion during icy nights and rocky slopes. Thank you. So big thanks again to Pierre Friquet for supporting us on Patreon. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 402 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the dystopian HBO series Years and Years, created by former Doctor Who showrunner Russell T. Davies. And this will include spoilers for all six episodes, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got our producer, John Joseph Adams. He's the editor of Lightspeed and Nightmare Magazines, and the series editor of the Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy. And he also oversees John Joseph Adams' books, an imprint of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. The latest book he edited, Chosen Ones, is the first adult novel by Veronica Roth, author of Divergent. So, John, welcome back. Uh, always good to be here. It, uh, feels like it's been years and years since I was on the <laughs> show last. The next up, we've got Tobias S. Bakel, making his 12th appearance on the show. He's the author of the Xenowealth series of space adventure novels, the eco-thrillers Arctic Rising and Hurricane Fever, and the Halo novels The Cold Protocol and Envoy. His novel The Tangled Lands, which he wrote with Paolo Bacigupi, recently received the World Fantasy Award. So, Toby, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. And also joining us today is Lisa Yazik, who you may remember from our feature interview back in episode 346, and from our panel on Giant Monsters as Metaphor back in episode 375. She's a professor of science fiction studies at Georgia Tech, and is author of the nonfiction books Galactic Suburbia, Sisters of Tomorrow, and The Future is Female. She also recently appeared in the AMC miniseries James Cameron's Story of Science Fiction. So, Lisa, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. All right, so let's start off with John. So, John, this show Years and Years came out back in June, and you just watched it recently. So mm -hmm. is there any particular reason why you watched it now and hadn't before? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, it... Uh is related to Wired.com, because uh, I happened to see an article that they posted that was saying, uh, like, here are the top science fiction shows of the year, and Years and Years was the number one show. And I actually hadn't even really heard of it. Um, I mean, if I'm, like, if I dig back through my memory, like, you know, maybe I could, like, remember, like, somebody mentioning this in passing at some point, but I, I just, I don't remember anyone talking about it. And so I was like, huh, there's the show that's, they say is the best show that was on TV this year, or best science fiction show anyway, and uh, I, I haven't even really heard about it. So I uh, decided to check it out, and uh, yeah, that's that's why I watched it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I heard about it when it came out. I didn't watch it. I heard it was good, and I came really close to watching it. But, um, you know, I just, I watched the trailer, and to me it just kind of looked like more Black Mirror and mm -hmm. I like Black Mirror, but I never even got around to watching season five. So, I, you know, I wasn't feeling a desperate need to watch something that seemed very similar. And then also it looked from the trailer like it revolved significantly around this kind of Trump-like politician who comes to power. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I already get enough of that <laughs> watching the news, you know, that I, I didn't, again, didn't feel a desperate need for to watch a TV show about it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so I never saw it. And, and again, yeah, when Wired dot com came out and said it was the best science fiction show of 2019 then i was like oh yeah wow maybe i should watch that and then they, <laughs> you encouraged me um to yeah. watch it um but so how about toby had you uh had you heard of this show had you watched it before i, I got in touch with heard you? of it i heard of it uh i didn't watch it when you got in touch with me i watched it about three or four months ago so shortly after it came out but not live while it was coming out so it was just uh you know it was, it, it it I had some of the same worries about watching it as you did, Dave, which was that I didn't, I didn't really, didn't really have some of the energy, emotional energy to, you know, deal with the, uh, Vivian Rook character, uh, when you're already living through it on both sides of the pond. And it was kind of oddly advertised. So it was kind of hard to figure out what exactly it was, as you mentioned. Yeah. So when you say it was, can you be, 
Can you go into more detail when you say it was oddly advertised? You sent uh, some of the posters to us by oh. email, <laughs> and you noted that it, it looked, you know, sort of like a 1980s soap opera almost. It, some of the visual aspects of the advertising, the video ads that I then saw were like very Black Mirror oriented, and then some of the other stuff that I read uh, focused on its kind of dystopian elements and kind of compared it to uh, Margaret Atwood's uh, Handmaid's Tale. So, between all three of those, I wasn't sure what exactly it was, and so I just kind of placed a marker on it to say, you know, when I have some free time, I'll come back around to watching this. But right now, if they can't figure out what it is, then I'm not sure, you know, you know, sometimes you're in the mood for different things. You have the emotional energy to watch something that's dystopic, and you can do that. And sometimes you're in the mood for adventure, and you're going to go watch that. So, you know, hey, it's one of the Doctor Who writers, so is this a fun show about the future or a Black Mirror weird? You know, uh, is this like a Twilight Zone, you know, BBC look at the future? I just couldn't figure out what it was from the advertising, and I knew I just would have to go watch an episode, and I just didn't have the kind of, you know, I didn't know where to slot it into my viewing energy, you know, yeah. <laughs> rotation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was actually John who sent around that ad, but we're basically the Sorry. same person, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, the, the, way, the way emails display in this day and age, like it's all just this <laughs> one long email, and so you just flip through it, and sometimes yeah. I miss. Yeah, well, let's come back to that ad, but I want to get Lisa in here. So Lisa, did you, um, like, what sort of, um, how did you come to watch uh, Years and Years? I, I came to watch it because you said, hey, let's do a panel about this. Uh, I had had the same reaction, really, that all the rest of you had had, that I remember it coming out last summer, and I remember thinking, I, I already live in a world that feels close enough to a dystopia, and I, I just can't even do that on television right now. So uh, I, I hadn't watched it, and I, I admit I was a little reluctant even when, when we started talking about this panel, but... Um, I'm actually glad I did. You know what? It sucked me in with that first episode, and then I ended up binging it in like a day or two, I think. Yeah. Well, so, John, tell us about this ad that you sent around, and, and why did you think that we should look at it? Oh, sure. Yeah, well, and, I mean, I, and I should just clarify, too, uh, uh, I, I'm not quite in the same boat as you guys in terms of uh, having any hesitation about watching it. I just, like, missed it completely somehow. It's like the, <laughs> the, the, way, they, the way they marketed it or whatever just somehow eluded me. And I didn't hear anybody talking about it, like, on Twitter and stuff, which is how I tend to, like, gauge whether or not I need to invest my time in a show sometimes. Um, and because it's like, I'd be all over that. You know, like, that's my thing. Like, that's my jam. I mean, it's like, I did this anthology of People's Future of the United States, and it's like, you know, this show is, like, tapping right into that, except it's, like, for Britain, you know, and yeah. so the United States. So it's like, so I would have been all over this show if I'd realized what it was and, you know, uh, knew that it was supposed to be great. And, and it just, I somehow missed it all. Um but yeah, the ad I was, uh, I sent, I sent around by email. It was just like, I, I, I was just like, I was just like Googling the show because I wanted to bring up the Wikipedia article. So it had all the names of the characters and everything. And, um, I, I clicked over to the, um, uh, to the image, Google image search just to see like what kind of images they had associated with the show. Cause, uh, cause the, the image that was on Wikipedia for the show looked strange to me. And it was like basically the same, the same ad that I sent you guys, except that it had like different font on the, um, uh, on the lettering, uh, or, or, you know, on the titles. And, um, and so when I went Googling for it, it's like, a, and I found this other version of it, which is like, it's just like a more cropped version of the one that's on Wikipedia. But then like the font for the title just like looks so, it looks so 80 sitcom to me. And I was just like, and, and, and like the, the image of the family, it's a basically an image of the family from the show. And like two of them are clearly laughing out loud Edith is sitting there with kind of a smirk on her face. Like, Celeste kind of looks shocked at what she's seeing. The grandmother looks confused. Yeah, well, and they're, they're um, watching the TV. They're, like, sitting yeah, on the yeah, couch yeah. watching TV. Yeah, but it's all very confused, like, in terms of, like, what? what is this show? Like, like I would have had no idea what that show was based on that. Like, it honestly, like like I said, it seemed, it seemed like, a, a, like some sort of comedy to me. And and once you once you see the uh, the series, you understand that they're all watching the TV and reacting yeah. to this Vivian right. Rook character. But but like when you see the advertising, you just have no context. And even some of the video ads for it, uh, like you were saying, John, like veered all over the place in terms of the emotion. They initially the some of the ads I saw. Now that you're saying this, responded to them all being shocked at the Emma Thompson Vivian Rook 
uh, character and how she was telling the truth. So if you've been, if any of you have ever seen Bullworth, it was this '90s uh, movie about a politician who uh, decides to just sort of quote unquote, you know, tell it like it is, and it's a comedy. So in seeing this, I couldn't tell if the Emma Thompson character was supposed to be played mm-hmm. for laughs because some of the previews kind of made it almost seem yeah. like that. Yeah, no, definitely the trailer looks like a comedy to me or like a very broad satire. Like I was expecting mm-hmm. something like that Black Mirror episode um, nosedive with Bryce Dallas mm-hmm. Howard right. where it's like social credits determine everything about your uh, yeah. role in society. Right. Which, I mean, I, I, I thought it was okay. It was an okay episode. I don't have anything against it, but I didn't really need to watch a whole mm-hmm. series like that. Um, but then it ended up being much, much more human and mm-hmm. emotionally yeah. affecting and serious yeah. and, and everything. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but so, so Lisa, why don't you say, you said that it really grabbed you right from the start. So kind of what was your experience of uh, watching, of sort of starting the first yeah. episode? Um, I'm trying to now sort of piece it back together, why I found it sort of so gripping right away. Um, I, I think I liked actually the diversity of people's reactions. And that kind of ties us back to what we're talking about with that um, advertisement that, that John had sent to all of us. Like, it's confusing to look at that image. You're right, because all the characters have such different expressions on their face. It's unclear, like, what the messaging is supposed to be. But, of course, right, once you've watched the show, you realize, oh, they're this very diverse family with very diverse politics. And everyone's face actually kind of matches their <laughs> reactions to Viv Rook, which is kind of interesting. Um, but you wouldn't know that till you've watched all six. I'm trying to remember what I really liked about it so much, especially since I'm in such an anti-dystopian mood. Don't forget, I live down in the U.S. South and in Georgia, where we're currently fighting a fetal heartbeat bill. So all kinds of fun dystopian crazy politics are happening here all the time. Um, I think, you know, part of I, I was impressed at how much like it really grabbed on to moments that are important to us now. And it feels almost given that it must have been written a few years ago, some of it, especially with like the immigration uh, camps, uh, feels weirdly prescient and scary. So what did I liked? I liked the even simple things like it had all this serious stuff, but then there were sort of goofy, fun science fiction moments. Like I liked the trans joke, frankly, in episode one, where the parents are are worried that their very distant daughter is, is transgender and it turns out she's transhuman. And I kind of enjoyed that. Um, the misunderstanding there, it felt like it made them well-rounded characters. And I, I cared about them even as they were obviously meant to represent institutions. Those actors were so good that they made me sort of believe that they were people as well as representations of something larger. And like a lot of good domestic science fiction is just, it's such a great microcosm for the world. And I just sort of wanted to see what happened to the family next. I started caring about them. Yeah, I wasn't crazy about the trans joke, just because it didn't seem that believable to me that the daughter would say I'm trans and Mm -hmm. Mm. not expect the parents to assume that she means transgender rather than transhuman. I mean, it just seems Mm -hmm. like sort of artificial to me to to be set up for this misunderstanding when it seems like in, I mean, she's a smart character and it seems like she would have explained Mm -hmm. how she felt more clearly. Uh, But Well, um, she's like a teenager. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, well, I, I guess you have, don't you, you have, uh, I have an 11 year old. So. Yeah. I, I think there, the, what was interesting was, was just the, uh, yeah, the, the, the way that, um, you know, they made the, the, the parents sort of very welcoming of the fact that they thought she was transgender and then very confused about mm-hmm. the transhuman thing, right. uh, which was a kind of a way of showing how, uh, it wasn't so much the joke, uh, which I felt like Dave was a little bit artificial, but I thought it was interesting that they were trying to capture the feeling of the way society marches on. So they would have been sort of right. progressive by our standards. Right. But then they couldn't, they couldn't go that much further with their daughter because they're like, this is too far. You know, this is a mixed race couple. They're, 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 you're, they're gonna, they're, they're talking about how they're gonna be well, warm and welcoming of her. Um, because they think she's she's trans, and then when she explains that she's transhuman, they're really upset because they can't, you know, when when she says she doesn't want to be a living thing, she wants to be uploaded into a machine, uh, and that her her goal is basically, as far as they can tell it, to suicide. Um, they just ha- struggle with it, and it it was just very interesting uh, because the the first half or third of the episode kind of makes them very sort of progressively sympathetic to us. 
um, and then they become like the non-understanding parents for their for the next mm, you know right. handful of episodes. And so I thought in that context it was kind of it was it was uh, kind of interesting. Well, yeah. let me just explain too that the the show starts out there's sort of a prologue that's in 2019, and then yeah. we very quickly jump five years into the future. So there's there's these sort of science fiction flourishes right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so most notably, um, the first thing is that th this daughter who who wants to be transhuman and upload her body uh, upload her minds has this sort of like Snapchat filter mask that she wears all the time that yeah. projects kind of a cartoon face over her own face. You can't see what mm -hmm. her real face looks like. Um, and it also talks and also makes her talk in a ridiculous baby voice and or right. other weird dog voice or something. I don't know. It was, it was an excellent thing to, 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 to be a fictional technology that would annoy the crap out of parents. <laughs> yeah, I like, see. I thought that like there were moments like that that just felt like spot on. And, you know, I sort of see what you're saying about the artificiality of it. But at the same time, I agree with Tobias. I feel like it may be in the reactions to mm -hmm. change that that's the moment that felt real to me. And also, I mean, just to sort of continue for a minute, I mean, as I've looked around online, you know, I'm a scholar, so of course I had to look around and research this and see what other people had been saying about it. <laughs> it was really interesting. People who don't know what transhumanism is really hated mm. that whole thread. Mm. And people Ooh. who identify as part of the transhumanist moment are, are really grateful for it, even if it does feel a little awkward and forced at first. They're like, at least this conversation was happening and we're represented. Mm. So, you know. Good for them. Inclusion and diversity. <laughs> Although I, I have to say, Toby, I, I I was sort of with her parents on that one. If my if I had a daughter who said she was going to upload her mind and have her physical body destroyed, I don't know <clears throat> how I, I I would not be cool with that. I mean, maybe if the uh, technology were sufficiently established that all the philosophical issues had been uh, addressed to my satisfaction, but it, I wouldn't want any I wouldn't want my daughter to be the an early adopter of a mm -hmm. of that sort of technology. Well, and that becomes that becomes a plot point even in in it, you know, where uh, they they do gain some sympathy for the parents uh, later on when when uh, you know things ensue. But I thought it was a really interesting way of showing how, uh, you know, I, I'm I, you know I'm I, I think of myself as as progressive, but it was a really interesting way of creating. And, and science fiction can do this; it creates that discomfiture of saying like. One day you too will be an old person who doesn't get the kids. And yeah. that was an interesting experience to have while watching it to think about that, right? Which was that here, here was a couple that would be considered forward thinking, quote unquote, progressive by our standards today. Um, you know, and I think trans rights are human rights, but like, and so do they, but like then this next step, you know, mm -hmm. was, was too far from them. And it might, you know, as, as as you said, David, it might be too far for you as well. And I, I, you know, we can talk about transhumanism. That's a whole like hour long show. But it was really <laughs> fascinating to use the the well, literary Lisa elements. Has to go at six, so let's, let's <laughs> have that conversation right now. But it was really fascinating to have that sort of um, science fictional feeling of sort of um, surprise and sort of social looking at how you could be made to become the old fuddy duddy. Uh, over yeah. this uh, change in technology, and I think that's like that's that's a science fictional experience you don't often get in visual media, but that you get more in print. And so I was really, I kind of enjoyed seeing that because I was like, that's that's the kind of weird stuff in science fiction and print that makes me really love the genre that you don't yeah. see as much yeah. Yeah. in visual. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, uh, one one thing about that uh, that it, that that part of the show uh, where you know they have this confusion over the the, the issue of the trans issue. I, I struggled with that, like Dave was saying, and I, and it's like I like the idea that they brought it up, but I, I didn't feel like it was really successful 100% the way it was delivered in the show. And I thought about a little bit how they could have done it differently, and my thought was actually that because the parents even say that they don't understand all the terms, like, you know, when they're talking to their daughter, they, they sort of stumble over some of the terms because, like, she starts saying things and they're like, oh, well, you know, we don't really know. Like, what are they saying now? You know, and they could have actually just looked at her search history and saw her literally searching for transhuman stuff and them just thinking like, oh, transhuman. Is that what they're saying now? Like, instead of just trans, there's like, oh, now they're saying transhuman, you know, like, or, or they yeah. can come up with some other term that would have made it more, it, it would have been like some other term that means transhuman that isn't actually sure. in use now that could have been more easily confused for for trans you know and and so it's like 
that that would have made the that would have made that conversation more believable and make it work better. Oh, see, I, I feel the exact opposite because I just finished. I teach gender studies, and mm-hmm. we did a whole unit on trans identity. And the whole thing right now is you don't say transgender or transsexual; it's just trans with an asterisk mm-hmm. after it to sort of cover everything. So I actually thought that trans joke worked, but maybe it's just because I was coming right out of having thought mm-hmm. about it a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess there's a lot more we could say about that, but we need to right. move past the first five Deal minutes the of episode five one before yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. we run out yeah. of time too much. But right. I, I want to say too, John, I mean, I saw that this show is really a science fiction show. And mm-hmm. I saw when you were um, online trying to spread the word about it, you were saying like, no, this is really a science fiction show if you're wondering about it. And that's maybe another kind of marketing failure of the show is that I, what, it is much more of a science fiction show than I had been led to expect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it totally. It looks like it's uh, like a family drama with maybe like a light science fiction element to it. I mean, or if you're just looking at the poster and stuff, like you don't know that there's any science fiction element at all. Um, and you know, the, the title could mean anything really. Um, but I mean, I, I, I mean, I have to say, like, uh, I have some quibbles, uh, with various elements of the show, like, like we were just discussing and there's other things too, but I love this show, like hardcore, <laughs> uh, like, yeah, no, I mean, I just, uh, I mean, it actually, I love this so much. It's like, it's almost, it's one of those things that almost makes me despair at what I'm doing with my life. Cause I'm like, well, uh, like, this is what I, this is, this is the kind of thing that I aspire to achieve. And I just, I just, I feel like I have like no chance of ever, uh, ever, ever, uh, you know, putting together something that will resonate in that way and or reach the, the same number of people or a similar number of people or anything. And so it was like, so, I mean, it's in, in, in one respect, it's like, oh, like, you know, just kudos. I just want to clap because it's like, oh, thank goodness someone's like doing something like this. Um, but then on the other hand, like, you know, uh, when I look at what I'm doing with my own career, it's like, oh, well, but this is what I've been trying to do. And, and I just can't, <laughs> you know, I can't do that. Um, but, you know, not everyone can can do everything as, as, as bigly or <laughs> bigly, <laughs> uh, as, as, uh, as boldly as they want to be, as, as, as boldly as they want to. Wait, John, are you suggesting that more people watch HBO shows than listen to Geek's Guide to the Galaxy? Yeah, I think it's a few. I'm sorry to break it to you, Dave. Um, and or like, you know, just read short stories. Uh, you know, people, people just don't read short stories that much, alas. Um, but, uh, hey, you know, uh, you mentioned that Veronica Roth novel. Maybe a bunch of people will read that. It'll be, it might be more people than watch the show. So, I mean, here's hoping. <laughs> All right. Well, before we get too discouraged, let's uh, keep talking <laughs> about this dystopian show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That'll cheer us up. <laughs> That'll cheer well, us up. But I agree with John. I think that that's part of what I liked about it is it's, it is as much science fiction as dystopian fiction, right? I mean, their world is not complete. I mean, it's, it's a kind of crappy world, but the world we live in right now is a kind of crappy world, right? And I think what I liked about the show is there's also these elements where things change and some things get a little bit better, right? I mean, they sort of seem like they crack the artificial food problem. Like they figure out, I mean, I realize it comes at the cost of people's jobs, of course, but to be able to feed people is a pretty big deal. Right. And things happen, right? Like there's some medical developments in that. And I think it's kind of interesting that it's not, it's not entirely like the handmaid's tale. It's not the whole world completely sort of winding down and going backwards. It's yeah, life. I, I, I agree. I think, I think in the first episode, it it's, it's in the near future. So we look at a politician who, you know, she, she's, she's an autocrat, uh, who, who, you know, they're all disagreeing about kind of having the conversation we're all having now. There's the transhuman thing, which, which, you know, they explore. But in the second episode, it really starts getting science fictional when they do the next fast forward, when they hit to 2025 and it's after the uh, nuclear strike. Um, and they start, uh, people start losing their jobs due to artificial intelligence. Right. Um, and it's not, at right now, there's this really common thing where it's like people are saying, oh, only only lower class people are going to lose to artificial intelligence and roboticization. But they show that like these white collar people are losing their jobs to artificial intelligence, right? And right. banking crisis. Mm-hmm. And I think that for me was like the more interesting thing that as as the white collar people who assumed that this was all funny that that these things don't affect them because they have money and security and status as they start having to do things like deliver meals and mm-hmm. and yeah. packages um they start having to deal with the same things that blue collar people right now are dealing with so this this for me this show wasn't even so much about um dystopia you know once we got into it and i understood what it was it's about a white collar family 
as a result of autom automation and poor political choices being shoved into the sort of world that blue collar people are kind of dealing with right now. But I mean, it is, I mean, I think the big concept for the show is to, is to like show how you get from, cause I mean, most dystopias, either we start out in the dystopia or um, it happens really quickly. Like, and this is one of my mm -hmm. issues with the handmaid's tale, but it's like suddenly, you know, um, there's soldiers on the streets and um, the main character is like, wait, where do these guys come from? Who are these people? And it just ha it seems sure. to happen. They've, they've suspended the constitution. Can they do that? And it just happens like overnight basically. And this is like, no, this happens and it takes years and years, which is the title. But, uh, and it's sort of, it happens so slowly often that you can't really, you know, like life seems more or less normal at each stage. And it's only looking over the whole span of the years that you're like, wait, we used to have a completely different society and now we're in a dystopia. And I agree, I agree that it's more complex and there's good things happening. But um, I mean, I thought that was one of the interesting things to me that I don't know that I've ever seen certainly a TV show that sort of took us on that journey from here's where we are right now. And by the end, there's like death camps and, mm -hmm. you know, here's the whole process. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, th this show, like, I, I very, I, don't, I can't think of any other uh, any other thing I've seen in visual media that has felt as much like a science fiction novel to me, or like a dystopian novel. You yeah. know, in the sense yeah. of like the the detailed level of world building that went into all of the different little changes that happen in the in the future that's presented in the in the in the series, yeah. uh, and then the ram exploring the ramifications of those changes. Um, you know, and, and, and I also thought it was really interesting how, how relevant it felt to me as an American, uh, even though this is completely set in the UK. And it's like, I mean, obviously I think, you know, they were, they were making choices in, in order to make it have this, uh, you know, worldwide appeal. So, I mean, and, and I mean, to some extent, uh, you know, the, the problems that are, you know, as Toby said, the problems that we're seeing here are also being seen in the UK and, and elsewhere around the world. Um, but it just, like, it was like, at first, I kind of was like, "Oh, I kind of, I kind of wish that there was someone who had done an American version of it, not not a remake of it or anything, but that this had been done, but with America as the focus." But then I was like, "Well, on the other hand, I don't know that it's necessary." It's like this is this was very successful, even uh, being you know uh, set in Britain. It's like I feel it feels just as relevant to me as an American as it would have otherwise. I think so. Uh, so I thought that was really interesting that they were able to do that. Well, and Toby was, I mean, Toby just sort of mentioned in passing the nuclear bomb going off. I want to mm -hmm. go back to that a little bit because that was really striking to me. So the first episode ends with the United States dropping a nuclear bomb on this disputed um, island uh, that sort of, I, I was a little, it was like an artificial island that China mm -hmm. had built. Yeah. Um, and and so, so a, a nuclear bomb gets dropped on it, launched by Donald Trump in the show. And it's like all, in his last day in office. In his last right? hours in office. Yeah. It's like his last 20 minutes or something. Yeah. And the characters all think it's the end of the world and all freak out and, and I'll do all this stuff. And then, the, you know, the next episode starts and life is for them has gone pretty much back to normal. And one of the characters, Edith, who's this sort of like Greenpeace activist type, makes this point that, you know, after Hiroshima, you know, most people mm -hmm. in the West, they just went back to their normal lives and, you know, that these these things happen that seem like the end of the world and are the end of the world for lots and lots of people. But then elsewhere in the world, um, you know, life just goes on pretty much as normal. And I thought that I've never seen that either in a, in a science fiction show or, or TV show. You know, it's always like, you know, I was I was expecting it to be Mad Max, you know, starting in episode mm -hmm. two or something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's that's a really uh, sort of a really interesting perception and and point to make, you know, having, you know, watched, you know, stuff go down that seems apocalyptic. And then afterwards you have to like still go to your day job. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like it I was mean, also, yeah, sorry. Oh no, no, no. I was just thinking about like, you know, as, as deep a, 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 a wound as nine eleven was like everyone had to go back to work the next day you know, from, for a lot of people. And if you weren't near those sites, you still had to sort of life had to carry on, even though you were still shook by it. Um, and there was this sort of quality to that, that's just sort of like, yes, all these other things will happen. There will be wars and consequences and financial ripples. And, and, you know, like now, uh, you know, now I, I, there was an ask me anything on Reddit where it was like a, a 15 year old saying, what was it like to fly around the country before 9 11, 
like mm-hmm. legitimate question. Like yeah. most of us probably remember it and we joke about, hey, remember when you used to be able to do X? But for this 15 year old, like he was genuinely kind of like genuinely interested in like what th- this is another time, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, Lisa, do you want to add anything here? Um, yeah, actually, it's interesting. As I was watching the show, I was thinking, I've been doing some, um, I had recently, have any of you read Naomi Elderman's The Power book that came out a couple I, of years I, ago? I'm, I know of it, but I haven't read it. Yeah, it's a British book, and it's really interesting um, that it, it it really resonated in, in much of the same ways as, as the show to me. And um, I recently gave a public lecture on it, and I was talking about it as a kind of um. Uh, as a post-apocalyptic dystopia, it's kind of stories we've been seeing more and more of in the last couple decades where the bombs fall and it's not the end of the world. Instead, we just sort of keep going. And if anything, we build the same world again, but usually a little bit crappier. And, <laughs> and, and right. The point of these stories is often that like um, for you as the reader to say, okay, where did it go wrong and where could we have done something different? How could we have turned the tide? And of course, this show actually shows you in the last two episodes how you can turn the tide. So that's a little different. But other than that, it was really, it really resonated to me with things like, I have to say, like some of the stuff Margaret Atwood's been doing recently, or um, if you know, like River Solomon or anyone uh, mm-hmm. it, it, that I really, and, and the Naomi Alderman book, The Power, of course, where uh, women get power and they drop bombs on the world and then they rebuild the world in their own image. And it's exactly like the world is now, except that hmm. role, except the roles are reversed and everything's just a little bit shittier. And um, so it's this interesting moment. I feel like it's part of the storytelling moment. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by it because I find I dislike these dystopias less than others. And, and I'm trying to sort of sort out in my own mind why, it feels like the moment again to tell these stories. Well, I think that's obvious because we <laughs> never mind. I, I know exactly why it's the moment to tell these stories. Um, but I do think it's cool, like as we keep saying, that it feels very literary. That it, it, it does match up with something I see happening in literature. When you mentioned the, that author being British, that reminds me one of these comments um, from a review that I sort of cut and pasted that I thought, I thought was interesting. It, it was making the point that Years and Years is, is this British show, and, and so is Black Mirror. And mm-hmm. that uh, Westworld, um, they say Jonathan Nolan is British. Yes. And that a lot of these sort of dystopian things are coming out of, you know, the yeah. UK. Yeah. And mm-hmm. this this um, reviewer was making the point that that people in the UK have maybe a better sense than anyone of how it feels to to feel like you're in decline and that you used to have mm-hmm. all this power and right. you don't anymore, and you're just very aware of that of yeah. change in your si- situation. Yeah, I think that's true. But at the same time, right, like um, and these stories I'm thinking about, they still in- insist sort of the way the British New Wave did in the 60s, that there's stuff going on. It's not just all about America and China, right, and Russia, and that there is the rest of the world. And even if it's if people are experiencing declines or shifts, like, as we're saying, life goes on and and your part of the world still matters and your part in the world still matters. I mean, one of the things I thought was I really liked was how the characters as the time progresses how they just mentioned in passing things like oh there's no more chocolate no more no mm-hmm. more bananas yes. no more butterflies mm-hmm. you know and it's just like it's not even the focus of a conversation it's just a throwaway detail but mm-hmm. it feels very yeah. believable that way and i know toby i mean you've you've written these eco thrillers and you've done a lot of research on climate change what did you think is that how realistic is that that things like chocolate might be disappearing in the next uh 10 to 15 years i you know I think we have greenhouses, so I don't think chocolate's going to disappear. I just th- I think it's going to be extraordinarily expensive. You, you look back to earlier days when uh, – I don't know if you know know this about pineapples, but they used to be next to impossible to ship all the way to England. And the amount of money it costs to grow them in a greenhouse was prohibitive. So the only people who could get pineapples uh, were the ones who could charter a boat to bring them pineapples. So the ultra-rich, hmm. the 1%. And you could even rent a pineapple. You'd be able to pay like a, you know, you could just sort of like timeshare a pineapple and have it for like your expensive banquet, uh, so that everyone could see that you were like baller enough to have a pineapple at your at Which, your at your dinner. But it wouldn't um, be eaten. But it wouldn't be eaten. No, okay. God, ah! right? You just have a pineapple, um, and and it's real, and you could sniff it. So uh, <laughs> if you look around to this day, like in in the UK and and in mainland Europe, there are a lot of pineapple uh, like iron. Uh, knockers and like uh, brass work and gates and stuff in like 18th century manners, right? And if you've ever wondered why there's so many pineapples in the decor, hmm. it's because that was sort of this like, you know, trying to, to look rich, right? And so 
like I, I think that would be more realistic. But yeah, I mean, we're 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 really struggling with some of those things, right? Like, uh, the thing that's going to be wild is sort of like wild seafood, you know, because yeah. the the amount of ocean warming we're getting is going to is is already causing, um, you know, the the small little you know baby. It's not even plankton; it's the thing that plankton eat. I think, uh, they're they have very uh, they they can't do any mild amounts of acid, so their shells are weakening. And they're, they're, they're going to, at, you know, at a certain point stop that the whole ecosystem in the ocean is going to collapse. And you know, we're on that, we're on that route already. Whether or not we even turn back and, and adopt green power, um, there's just so much heat being dumped in the ocean and it takes so long for it to recover, unlike the air, because it's got so much thermal mass that I just think a lot of that, that damage is going to be baked in and we will be experiencing things like that at the same time while having amazing things like electric cars. So you get these weird dichotomies when you start digging into the research, like I think they did where, you know, you'll have things like amazing food technology, right. That they, that they have as well as, as well as these, these shortages that they just kind of, you know, you just kind of work around um, and deal with. I yeah. don't know. I think not having chocolate would be tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, one of the things that I really loved, uh, I mean, I loved a lot of the little technological uh, innovations that they, you know, sort of incorporated into the show. But uh, since we already skimmed past it, I just wanted to say, like, the I really love the Hong Sha Dao uh, artificial island uh, storyline because it's like, that's like something I read about like years and years ago, like before I even knew anything about science fiction. I read this book called The Millennial Project that was like, basically a, a science fiction non-fiction book like yep. t teaching you how to build a science fictional future um yeah. and it was like it just had it was like full of all these ideas it was like a book that science fiction writers could read and be like oh hey i could write like a million different short stories out of all these different things in here um but one of them one of the ideas in there was like this idea of constructing artificial islands and it was just like it just like blew my mind back then my my baby little science fiction reader mind um and and it's like i hardly have ever seen anyone incorporate that into science fiction and i just thought that was really cool to see that in that um sort of near future uh context of this show which is not about like wild uh science fictional advances per se but to just have it in the background there and then to have like this catastrophic event arise as a as a, as a result of it um which is also you know one of the things that like has terrified me since uh trump has been elected president <laughs> that he might do something like that um but, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's, I just, I just, uh, I, I'm really fascinated by that idea of, of making artificial islands, especially as we continue to have, uh, you know, difficulty, uh, you know, sustaining all the people that we need to put places uh, as it is. You know, actually, and I don't want to go, get off too much on this, but, you know, I interviewed Daniel Ellsberg a year mm -hmm. or so ago, and he had written a book about how there are no, essentially no uh, controls on our nuclear arsenal. Mm -hmm. And so you always, I mean, it's scary enough to think that the president might be impulsive or unstable and, and launch nuclear attack that's completely unnecessary. But actually, the even scarier reality, which I hadn't realized, is basically anyone involved in command and control, anyone in the silos, anyone piloting the bombers could basically just choose to start a nuclear war on their own initiative, and there would be nothing to stop them. They don't. There's not actually, in reality, any codes or any, any way to stop someone who has a nuclear weapon, you know, in the military who has it in their possession from, you know, using it. Uh, and so, yeah, we really need to have fewer nuclear weapons, uh, because just every one that we have is multiplying the chance that mm -hmm. somebody somewhere up and down the chain of command is going to be unstable and do something really, really bad. And so far, like we keep getting lucky in that, like every time we've had a mistake and a mistaken kind of, you know, mm -hmm. signal that there's a you know, a need to launch a nuclear weapon, the actual person who has to launch the nuclear weapon has basically dallied around and refused until, mm -hmm. you know, personally satisfied, even at the cost of, you know, rank and job, uh, because they feel much the same as, as you do. <laughs> yeah, but I don't want to, I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, yeah. but just check out, um, the, the Doomsday Machine by Daniel Ellsberg if you never want to sleep again. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we haven't really – and there's so many characters, too, in this show. I don't know how much mm -hmm. time I want to take going through all of them. But I'll just say that basically the um, it's the, the sort of – the story centers around this politician character we've mentioned, Vivian Rook, who becomes prime minister, who sort of a – you know, starts off as a TV talking head and 
is sort of a popular becomes a populist demagogue prime minister uh, and and ultimately you know with very strong totalitarian uh tendencies and then also there's this this ordinary family of the lions um and so there's the grandmother and then her she has four adult grandchildren um and then there's sort of their kids and spouses and stuff like that um but so i don't know so um lisa what did you think just um uh, did you connect with all those characters uh, did you like them um well i don't think i liked them all by any chance by any stretch <laughs> of the imagination there's too many of them and and i think that that would have been um not the, the goal of the show anyway but i i liked the diversity of the characters and you know some of them i i liked um some of them I found terrifying and, and I think that that was all sort of interesting. Um, it was really, it got fun to hate Steven the more and more he yes. fell. Um, and, and that was sort of interesting. And then I was also interested in the end because he does some pretty unconscionable things um, in episodes, I think three and four and maybe five. And what's interesting is that he's forgiven in the end, essentially. Yeah. And, I read a lot of reviews that were very, very irked about that, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> and and I myself had to think about it for a minute. But again, you know, I think uh, and and also, um, oh, gosh, uh, Rosie also, who's very much a supporter of Vivian Rook um, un until that works against her. Right. But they both sort of there's no repercussions for their investment in this sort of horrible um, regime. But then again, that's life. <laughs> I think a yeah. lot of times people get invested in bad things and get off. And and of course, neither of them are wholly bad people. There are people who are are pressed to the point where they they do some crazy, crazy and evil stuff. Especially Stephen. I, I would say person. I would say what Stephen does in episode four to uh, Victor is uh, mm -hmm. pure evil. That I, I was not happy he got away. Uh, yeah, with forgiveness. Yeah. Rosie. You know, Rosie self-centered. She she's super fan of Vivian Rook until it hurts her personally. Right. I mean, that's that's. I mean, it's, there's so many people in the area of the country I live in that are basically uh, Rosie. Yeah. Um, but mm -hmm. Stephen is like actively malicious, right? And mm -hmm. so yes. the the redemption arc for him more 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 than Rosie. The redemption arc for him really troubled mm -hmm. me, and and yeah. that was the one yeah. aspect of the show that actually I was pretty. Uh, upset about in the last episode mm -hmm. where I was just basically like, I still am basically in team. Screw you, Steven. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> well, it's, it's he does do some prison time, but yeah, not enough. Three years and then he gets to go teach kids in Spain? I mean, right, come on. Right. He gets off that's... easy if you ask me. But that's but, so um, European, right? I mean, that's that's I'm baked in the American justice system where I kind of like want to see him punished, right? I yes. want to see him punished. I want to yeah. see him suffer. Right. The fact that he's had a realization and comes around, which is what we should want as a civilization, that he's had a right. moment of clarity and realizes what the system has done to him and that he is going to turn around and ask for forgiveness and seek to improve his ways. Right. After what he's right. done, like I'm like, that's not enough. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And it should be enough. Right. But it's, right. it somehow is not. But um, I, I've, I've noticed like I saw the same thing in the power. There's a terrible character. He's the white guy patriarch. And he does awful, unconscionable things, and he's forgiven in the end. And it seems to be, again, part of sort of this story form, um, which maybe the point is that at some point you got to stop the hate, Yeah, I guess. All right, I want to we, – we've sort of jumped ahead, and I, I'm afraid we might have lost some people who <laughs> oh. <laughs> who haven't actually watched the show and are, are listening to this. But yeah, but but my – so let's just rewind a little bit. But so my experience of watching the show is, you know, I said I wasn't that – um, excited about watching it. I mean, John said it was really good. So I, you know, I sort of trust his judgment. Um, so I was happy to watch it, but, uh, I really sort of had to motivate myself to actually sit down and start it. But then once I started watching it, I couldn't stop. And I watched the whole, mm -hmm. you know, six episodes in one day. Oh, um, wow. That's, a, that's, a, lot of, that's a lot. That's a lot. It is. And I, I basically like loved everything unconditionally, I, I guess, except for, um, more or less unconditionally up to the end of, I think, episode four, whenever, um, Danny dies was the first thing that really yeah. kind of threw me because I, I, I had sort of been, you know, so, so, so Danny is the, is one of the, um, adult grandchildren and he's a gay man and he, um, falls in love with a, um, one of the, uh, asylum seekers in, yeah. in Great Britain and, um, and then uh, all sorts of, you know, uh, problems ensue trying to, you know, the guy, the, his, um, love interest gets deported and then he's trying to save him. And, um, and I, I just, you know, and, and you're just constantly tense about what's going to happen. And, and it gets to the point where you think it's going to work out. And, um, you know, 
uh, I was I was really apprehensive that it was going to be a tragic gay love story, which I mean mm -hmm. that is is fine, but it it's, is. you know, I um you know I was kind of hoping it wouldn't be. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, so that was kind of the first thing that I, I really felt ambivalent about, and then kind of after that, there were there were a lot of things in the show that um, sort of bugged me, and so I really have completely different feelings about the first four, like everything up to that point, and everything after that point. Where up to that point, it's like a um, like I said, it's the story about basically about ordinary people trying to go about their everyday lives as the world gets steadily worse in the background, and then it becomes much more of uh, sort of overtly dramatic, maybe even melodramatic and um, a little hard to believe, sort of more sort of spy thriller elements that I have a lot of mixed feelings about. So, I mean, John, you said you, you love this show so much, right? Do you have any, do you share yeah. any of those feelings that you didn't like the the ending as much as the some of the earlier stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think it's certainly better at the start than it is at the, the, the sort of front end is better than the, the back end um, in terms of like, overall you know just sort of writing in general uh and and i mean yeah i have i have like little uh you know nitpicks and stuff that that you know i would change if i was editing it and everything but uh nothing nothing that bothered me uh so much that i ended up not liking the show or anything um i, I shared your your concern over uh the tragic gay love story part you know where i was like you know oh no come on like uh, of all the characters, don't kill that one. You know, it's like his, you know, just because it's like become a cliche uh, to do that. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, but I mean, yeah, I also agree. Like uh, uh, some of the stuff, like right in the last episode, was particularly hard to believe with the technology, like with the, you know, uh, some of the, you know, quantum computer stuff that they're yeah. doing. Like, yeah. I mean, it's basically magic. Um, you know, to some extent, uh, some of the other stuff in the show also kind of seems like it might be magic as far as uh, we would know. I mean, just because it's so so advanced. But um, but but that in particular kind of seemed a little hard to believe, um, especially in that timeline. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to explain, though, that you know, we're talking about the, the arc that Stephen goes on where he, you know, he, he's been this sort of ordinary um, financial advisor. And then there's the banking crisis and he. Uh, now he has to work all these very low paying jobs and kind of becomes more and more embittered. I mean, other stuff happens too, but ends up joining the, um, the Vivian Rook government. And I felt like, um, I felt like that happened really fast, like yeah. you know, that, that he became a villain. And I felt like there maybe needed to be an episode or two, you know, uh, yeah. make, you know, showing us that, that transition more. Um, and so he ends up, um, the, the really bad thing he does is that he's in, in the computer system and transfers, um, Victor, who's, um, his, his, bro his deceased brother, Danny's, uh, love interest into one of these death camps, uh, cause he blames him for, for Danny's death. Um, cause they, they died trying to get back, trying to cross the channel but to get back to, to, to England. Um, and so, um, so Toby, it sounds like you agree that 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 turn yeah, was a little too that much whole, for that character. That whole thread was too much because it all comes out of basically, you know, killing the, the it comes out of the killing the 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 lover, right? So it's the doomed gay couple. No one else in the family, you know, dies like that. So out of that death comes then the sudden turn of the Stephen character into being a full on villain. So that that's I think made you know, the end sort of problematic. And like you said, kind of like a super spy thriller where they're breaking in to get data and he's like breaking in to do things with the computer system and there's a gun all of a sudden. The whole kind of tone changes a lot for those last two episodes. And and I understand, you know, like I see why they, narratively, I see why they did it. But like it, I, I, like everyone says, I feel like the world building and, and everything that was done in the first section of the show is is so much better that uh, I don't know if they had to do all that. Um, and I, it didn't quite ring true for me. It was more a plot oriented set of developments than it was mm -hmm. like a character set of developments. Yeah. So Lisa, yeah. what do you think about that? Yeah. I think that that's actually a great way to describe it, that, that it, it, it did. It felt like they, like there was a need to wrap up this plot, right? Because mm -hmm. you had six episodes to do it in. And so, a lot of emotional development has to happen very quickly. And and like you say, not only does Stephen become a villain very quickly, but he's redeemed extraordinarily quickly as well. And it's like, oh, surprise, he really wasn't doing anything bad. He was going to do this good thing. And then you're like, really? I, I don't know. I'm confused now about what's going on. So, um, I, yeah, I mean, at the one hand, 
I like the idea in the last two episodes. I'm a utopian. I like the idea that maybe eventually people could be pushed far enough that they would fight back. I certainly hope to God that that is the case, right? Um, so I like that. But yeah, the sort of cyberpunk criminal caper that shows up all of a sudden at the end, it felt unnecessary. I'm not sure we, we needed that kind of thrill when there was already so much emotional drama with what was already happening. Oh, actually, actually I mean, now you mention it. I mean, I, the, the thing probably that, that I disliked the most was that they end up saving Victor from this, this camp by basically exposing what's happening to the world. And then basically that solves everything and the police arrest the prime minister. And that just seems like complete fantasy. To and I, I hate, I hate that. I hate that, uh, that stereotype because as we've just now discovered, right, in this kind of media environment that this world is positing, just releasing that information doesn't do anything right that's just the beginning of the hard work and so for me that was that that's cheap you see it in the pelican brief you see it in all these other techno thrillery type things it's just like if we can just get this information to the newspaper everything will change right and we we just don't live in that world anymore and we haven't since like the yeah. 1970s that's a common trope in dystopian stories too i mean a lot yeah. of mov movies especially yeah but... Yeah. It's, it's, it goes all the way back to Marshall McLuhan. This was like the McLuhan-esque fantasy of the early 1960s, right? The whole idea that modern communication technologies would turn us into a global village and we would wear each other on our skin and that would make us more responsible for each other. And just you'd flip on the TV and light would be shone into the dark corners of the world and, and evil would be exposed. And it sort of feels like it wants to tell that same fantastic story. And again, I do want to tell stories where people have power and agency to change the world. But this was just it too simple, right? Right. You can't just like release a video to YouTube and hope the world's mm -hmm. going to change. We've been doing that. And, and right. I mean, that's happened with the current concentration camps in the United States. I mean, or right. whatever you want to call them. And I want to call them that. And that video does get released and they're still there. And that's I think so. Oh, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. So that's OK. Go ahead. Uh, I, 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 what I was going to say is I think my great big critique of the ending I, I deeply love the setup. I love the science fictional exploration. But the deep critique of the ending is that I think that the writers of the show do not have a ton of experience in probably uh, on the, the organization that it takes to fight back against mm -hmm. uh, systems like this. And that shows up very deeply in the ending. They've done a lot of thought about how you get there, but they have not done a lot of grappling with the thought of how you get out. They have not looked at resistant, you know, peaceful resistant right. movements, uh, how you build the networks. And they were starting to get there because like with the characters of Rosie and her neighborhood being put up, you know, that the, Rosie lives in a poor neighborhood with a lot of crime and, and, and eventually, you know, they, they, they kind of brick that up, you know, the, the police uh, create curfews and they start to become active um, and, and uh, active resistance even. Um, and active resistance isn't just a single moment of just suddenly getting upset like they show. It is a, you know, slow planned long series of, of, of work that you have to do. And, and not showing the character doing that, um, was, I thought, uh, came from kind of like a blind spot as well as the fact that like there were these opportunities to show, um, community and how that is the sort of like way you fight back against this sort of stuff. And, we have kind of like this miniature moment. Some of my favorite moments of the show were like when Celeste uh, moves in with uh, Muriel yeah. um, and they start developing these new bonds and they start yeah. these, you know, even though family and the white family, the UK white family has shown to be the unit towards the end of the show, there's this interesting thing of found family and acquired family happening where it becomes mm -hmm. uh, Celeste and Muriel and Victor um, and, and her granddaughter. Um, uh, uh, start becoming this like this different uh, multi generational community, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and start bringing in some other people from the community who are friends. And that was the moment where I kind of thought uh, it was going somewhere very interesting about the resilience of of all of us coming together to fight these things, and how getting an experience with Celeste's story and Victor's story was changing Muriel because it's this yeah. exposure that changes things. And we kind of flinched away from that for a, for a techno thriller ending. But that's where I thought it was kind of starting to pick at something that was really powerful and true that could have taught us something. And then it, it kind of walked away from it. Yeah. I mean, I think that the issue is that you set up this story where there's this family and there's Vivian Rook. So it's kind of natural to want those two stories to intersect somehow at the climax. 
And then you don't want it to be just like, oh, things get worse and worse and worse, and then everything sucks, and that's the end. You know, <laughs> uh, Russell Davies clearly wanted there to be sort of, you know, this to be kind of a call to action in a way, mm -hmm. and to, you know, shake people out of their complacency and, you know, change the world and stuff. But then you get this sort of very artificial ending. So I guess I'll throw out there, given that those were sort of the structural pressures pushing toward this sort of an ending, do we have any ideas about what else the show could have done in the last episode or two? Oh, and, I, I, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, I want to uh, get to John. Yeah. I want to get back to John. So let's I'll yeah. give John first crack at this. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure where I would have uh, suggested it go. I mean, it sounds like Toby has some ideas, but uh, <laughs> one thing I had a thought about was that it, it kind of felt like uh, it kind of felt like a situation where they thought they had more time to tell the story, but then they then their budget got cut or their number of episodes got cut or something, and then so suddenly they 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 had sort of laid out the first three episodes, and then they realized they only had three episodes to wrap everything up, and and so this was like the shortcut way to get to you know to to wrap things up in some sort of satisfactory way, or also like in a maybe judging based on just some of the promotional stuff but like you know for instance the the poster that we were talking about earlier that's just the family there's no picture of vivian rook in there and i kind of wondered if it was like they 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 plan to have the whole show not really be have like vivian rook be a primary character at all and then they sort of added her in afterward after the fact because they were like oh well we need like another we need like a bigger star to be somebody that can uh help uh carry the show and so you know they got emma thompson to play vivian rook um you know, I don't know how it actually came about, but like I could see how they could have like grafted the Vivian Rook stuff onto the show that had already been starting to be filmed and, and in progress. It, I mean, like I said, I don't know if that's what happened, but it, it kind of I kind of wondered if that's the kind of thing that did happen. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything really about the circumstances of the writing, but I, I think and I, I should check this, but I'm pretty sure that all these episodes were just written by Russell T. Davies. I don't think yeah. it was a team. Um, right. And that's maybe and I mean, there's so many things he does incredibly well in terms of portraying yeah. these characters yeah. but like toby's saying it, it this might have benefited from bringing in some other people who might mm -hmm. who might you know maybe know a little bit more about yeah, yeah political resistance and things like that right um but let's go i want to get back to lisa too do you have any thoughts about what what else might have happened at the end yeah i mean again i i've, I've been thinking about it because like i said i i want to i i didn't want it to just go into pure dystopia i mean i i do like the idea that there's some hope somewhere uh that people can resist but what's um i but how would you do this in 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 the same amount of time i mean i agree it feels like you need more episodes to be able to unpack the way that you put like networked politics into action right i I, I, I wanted to hear a little bit more about you know right so we start to see rosie's people organizing and we know of course that edith has been a political organizer all along and people sort of all meet up at the end but not really i kind of wanted to see more discussion and 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 uh contact between all these different groups as they're starting to form um rather than sort of one you said it's like all of a sudden everyone's magically unified i i just I, it takes more time right and there's drama in that as well but again it well, takes time and, and this is a six episode series and six yeah, is sort of an odd yeah. number i mean everything is Ooh. 10 pretty much these days and i just wonder yeah if they if there was some sort of budget issue where they they didn't um you know the uh production companies or uh, networks didn't have faith that this was going to attract a wide enough audience to justify an investment of 10 episodes i'm just speculating there but all right so toby why don't you lay your lay all your genius ideas on <laughs> that genius um i really i really felt that you know uh if they had dug into rosie alliance's neighborhood um, including, you know, maybe them relocating, um, but even just trying to create the community, um, and finding ways to kind of create that, that, you know, uh, structure and, 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 uh, sanctuary and, you know, uh, many different kinds of people coming together that they, they could have used the, the through line of her neighborhood because there's so many different people who come in and out of her life in, in there that she could have they could have drawn more of that, shown the community as being the base of how you resist, right? Which is to flip the gates, you know, from a thing that is keeping us trapped here to a thing that's keeping them out, um, as a metaphor, right? Um, you could have done that in six episodes. So instead of them rising up and saying they can, they can leave at any point, you know, them, you know, keeping those cops out 
from uh, coming to take someone and having a victory there. So it'd be the sort of thing where you'd end it with a small victory that shows that there's going to be larger victories elsewhere. Um, if people are able to, on a community level, just say, no, we will not stand for this. Because there are lots of examples of moments like that happening um, in history, and that those have been successful at saving lives and changing things, you know. Um, even on the on the level of just sort of like, um, I'm thinking of like that uh, Danish uh, town that is, uh, you know, kind of anarchist and, and refused to let any police in, and, and, you know, starting in the 70s was, you know, completely like a, a different place right now um, there are they're, they're little examples of that that you can use to kind of show community organization and that they could have looked to as a model that would have worked i think narratively um to show how you would organize and how you could get everyone in a community to do this sort of thing you know like the the, the paris resistance you know like putting up the blockades and holding the block i mean you, you guys were saying earlier that there's no you don't really that Stephen never faces an adequate punishment for what he's done. But I feel like I don't even particularly remember any scenes where he or Rosie ever have to confront the fact that they shouldn't have been supporting Vivian. Rose. They don't. They, they don't. don't. I seems was like thinking a very about odd that. Omission yeah. 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 It, was, it reminded me of something uh, 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 someone once told me who is older. They said, uh, you know, the day after Nixon resigned, you uh, couldn't find a single person who'd ever voted for him. <laughs> yeah. Um, the way we are as humans, I think, just sort of kind of pretend that never happened when you make a horrible mistake. Yeah. Well, so actually, that makes me think. I mean, one of the questions I wanted to ask is, I mean, this show clearly has sort of an activist um, intention to it. Um, do you think that that's what will have any impact or is this is the whole presentation of this show kind of preaching to the choir like are only people sympathetic who are going to be sympathetic to its political message going to watch it in the first place like is any are any trump supporters going to watch this show because it feels like i would just imagine trump supporters would watch the show and be immediately turned off by the fact that vivian rook is sort of an obvious mm -hmm. you know politician in that mode and and is being presented in in a negative light and and just immediately tune out. Whereas right. one of the big advantages of uh, science fiction often is that you can present uh, a situation that doesn't have, that doesn't immediately raise people's partisan hackles and sort of like sneak your message in. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, so John, you, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah. I mean, well, that's always the question and the challenge uh, when you're doing some kind of, uh, when, when you're attempting to do something like that with science fiction to, you know, try to get some message across. Um, and, and I mean, I, I had a strong feeling that you could reach people uh, trying to do that, uh, tell these kinds of stories and maybe change people's minds. I had that strong feeling for a while. And over the last several years, it sort of eroded um, whether, you know, that I think that anything can actually be done with it. Um, you know, um, I mean, it's it's basically what I was trying to do with a People's Future of the United States. But then it's like, you know, as it was coming out and everything and we were seeing reviews and everything, I was like, yeah, I mean, it is, it does seem like we were just preaching to the choir with it. Um, like, I'd like to think that somebody might pick it up who uh, is sort of more uh, maybe not polarized one way or another and could pick it up and, and realize uh, some some truths about the world that we live in um, and come down on the right side. But, um, yeah, I, I just don't know that, it, you know, I just don't know about that, it, the, the power of science fiction to do that in general anymore. Um, and then in this case, yeah, I mean, I think, like, it does it does seem hard for me to imagine anyone having their mind changed by this show um so unfortunately yeah lisa, much as i would like it to be otherwise lisa do you think this show is preaching to the choir well you know it's like joanna ross once famously said science fiction isn't going to change anyone's minds about anything but it can crystallize an awful lot of things that we're feeling and not quite able to articulate and so mm -hmm. I think in that respect, you know, like this is a show that could certainly reach um, it's it, it's you know, you've got the people you've got some people on the left, maybe even all of us who are already convinced of the message and some people who were saying will never be convinced of the message. But it's a lot of people in between that maybe this becomes a way to sort of articulate some of your discomfort and anger um, with where the world is and to play with where, you know, mentally how, where and how that might work out. So. 
Yeah, so, and I guess yeah, it I is uh, popular, to that. popularizing transhumanism. Maybe that's the whole agenda. That's well, the whole secret yeah, agenda. Yeah, no, I think I think, but the idea that we, you know, this is this is your America. You live in it. You let it happen, but you can also change it. Like that's pretty important, right? I mean, Thomas Pynchon said that in The Crying of Lot Forty Nine in the '60s, and then one of the characters says that literally again, almost word for word, somewhere in this show. And I, I still think it's a valuable message. Mm -hmm. Mural's speech yeah, I mean, I guess is that's really the... powerful. Yeah, that that is basically like the crying mm -hmm. of yeah. I, I mean, I was going to say the uh, you know the the one thing that maybe the show is effective at is even though it might be preaching to the choir, it might be getting the choir to be like, hey, yeah, we got to do something. Yes, you know, this is this is the world we this is the world we made, and we can't just we can't just allow it to continue the way it's going. We need to do something about it. Whereas we might be more inclined to be like, oh, well, things will sort itself out. You know, it's like there's people who are, uh, you know, it's their job to deal with this stuff and we're going to vote for people and they're going to do the thing. But it's like, it, it, I think the idea is maybe to to get you more um, sort of, uh, you know, to, to get you more motivated to do something more more than more than just voting, you know, more than, you know, being an activist and, and, and such to, to, to affect the change that you want to see happen in the world. So, yeah, I, I would agree with Lisa that it's a really good point that we're, you know, people sort of say like preaching to the choir means that one should not, one should feel like giving up sometimes on doing stuff like this. But there are a lot of people who are not talking on the sidelines, right? Mm -hmm. That I think I agree with her that it's really important to talk to. Sometimes when you're having these very public debates, it's not that you're going to change the other person's mind. It's that you're trying to talk to the people who are who are not yelling at each other, who are just watching this. Um, and I think that's incredibly important. Two, I think it helps us in the choir to see patterns. For example, I had never drawn the connection between how you can choose to not vaccinate people in camps to cause the disease in killing and then kind of throw your hands up with plausible deniability mm -hmm. and say, I, who could have, who could have seen this coming? These are dirty people that we put here and this is their disease. This isn't our fault. Um, because we see that happening right now, right? Uh, they're refusing to give flu vaccines to people in camps here in, in the United States. And what's going to happen is when, uh, people die of the flu in those camps, um, conservatives are going to throw their hands up and say, well, those were dangerous people that we shouldn't have, uh, al allowed to cross the border. Um, and that was shown how, how that's done. The mechanism, exact mechanism of how it's done was in years and years, um, shown fictionally. And I had never, come across that concept before, even though I've read about camps and I, I have been like, these things are horrible and I'm opposed to them and I've called senators. But like the moment I heard that the flu vaccines were going to be denied to people in camps and that they're being denied access to doctors, I immediately understood why, right? Because I'd right. seen it on years and years. I immediately knew what the end game was and why they were trying to do this. And it was not, it was not some, oh, it's, it isn't a shame they're not giving them doctors. I immediately understand the chilling ramifications of it because I watched years and years and was like, holy crap, now I'm three times as outraged. And it's important um, for us to get outraged and, and to do something. Um, Rachel Bittekoffer is this uh, analyst that's showing it's it's not so much trying to convince people on the other side. It's trying to get all the people who already agree with you to go to the polls. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so that's why I think stuff like this is important. Um, and for a long time, I've heard people say, like, you're just preaching to the choir. And I think that's oppositional um, defeatism. That's, that's, that's something people tell you to try and get you to stop talking about this stuff. Mm. Um, and I think it's actually really good to preach to the choir and get the choir psyched and active mm. and out there. Well, that's the, all right. Well, I, I feel I feel better then, Toby. Uh, I feel like I, I'm not I'm not wasting my time. So that, that, when you say that you you learn about that from years and years, there's this um, scene where Vivian Rook talks about the history of this idea yes. in relation to mm -hmm. the the British Empire and the mm -hmm. Boer War yeah. in South the Boer Africa. War. Yeah. And what I'm just curious, what did everyone think of? So, so um, when Stephen starts working for the government, he gets this. There's this scene where he meets Vivian Rook, and previously she's been this um, sort of, you know, sarcastic, affable, um, you know, sort of TV personality. And then when we meet her in person, she seems you know, I mean, much more overtly sinister, but also sort of like defeated and afraid and, um, you know, almost like zombified uh, in, in, a, in a psychological sense. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, what, what were people's reactions? I don't know, John, what was your reaction to, see, to that where we see her 
And she she mentioned something like, I can't do that. They would have me killed. Like th- this right, yeah. right. implication she's being controlled by some. Yeah, form. yeah, yeah. No, I thought that was really interesting. And, and also how like we sort of see her as not just sort of the 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 sort of dummy that we're sort of led to led to believe that she is, you know, like, you know, initially it's like she makes some um, some basic errors in uh, in how governance works in the UK, uh, you know, in a debate. And so she gets called out on it. And so it's like, OK, well, maybe that was real. Maybe that what maybe that was on purpose or maybe that was a, a real mistake. But then, like, you know, as we see in the in the last episode, uh, you know, she she gives this lecture on 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 concentration camps and and so and it was it was pretty that was extremely chilling because it was like yeah because like i mean i didn't know anything i didn't know about that i mean i assume that's real that the the real history that she was saying um but i mean i didn't know anything about it and and that was the point that's actually that's a really interesting point john that i hadn't made that connection but that she knows the whole history of the boer war but doesn't know what an export tariff is right and so is she just is that just a, a writing mistake or is she just pretending to right. not know what an export tariff is because that just makes her more appealing to her right. kind of anti-intellectual constituency right. or? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I mean, it, it is a, a possibility. I mean, at least in part because like I, I've seen a lot of talk about like, you know, Trump, for instance, who it's like, oh, well, you know, he, you know, I mean, obviously we, you know, we suspect that he has like cognitive decline. And so it's not, it's not like a game with, or it's not like, you know, it's not like um, some sort of trick he's trying to pull to make a, make him seem not as intelligent. But I mean, it's like, uh, it, it does seem like, you know, there's things that Trump does that are clearly on purpose when like, he obviously knows better and knows what the actual reality is. Um, and so like with, with Rook, I was kind of looking for that kind of same parallel where it's like, oh, well, uh, you know, yeah, it's like she's portraying herself as this this one way, but really she's cleverer than that, and and you know she does know things, and 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 so that that sort of adds that sinister feel to yeah. to seeing behind the mask there in that last episode. She actually reminded me of the Bushes there, right? Like they're always putting on their down home Texas accents, but these are yeah. Yale educated men who roll with Saudi princes. You know, let's be realistic about this. Right. So I I think it's no, it's not just Trump, and it's not you know. Just uh, it, it, there's lots of politicians and we could be looking and talking about British politicians who do much the same thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, actually, when um, George W. Bush ran for governor for governor, I think it was governor the first time he was defeated by someone who, who you know, portrayed who um, characterized him as, you, you know, a Yale educated Connecticut elitist right. mm-hmm. Yankee, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And he famously said after that, I'm never going to be out good old boy again. Uh, and, yeah, there you, know, you go. Constructed yeah. This, you know, Texan yeah. persona. Um, but yeah, it hadn't really occurred to me the extent to which Vivian Rook was intended to be doing that in the show until until John made. That. But um, yeah, I don't know, Toby. Do you have anything else about Vivian Rook's double persona or anything there? No, I, I wasn't sure how to take it actually when I saw that because we never really get it explained who the mm-hmm. sinister forces are behind her. So I was so worried we were going to go down that road too. I actually mm-hmm. didn't yeah. want to know because I was like, mm-hmm. no, don't do this story because that's another yeah. just sort of pot boiler kind of plot, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then it's Manchurian Candidate. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> I just I just saw nothing but sort of potholes down that road, right. so I was just like, <laughs> eh. it was more of kind of like my last two episodes m- misgivings, you know, just sort yeah. of like, eh. you know, I I didn't I actually did not want Stephen to ever meet her, like I I, f- I felt she was for me more chilling being being on the television, although they had to get that concentration camp info in somehow because mm-hmm, that, yeah. that 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 for I mean I. It, as much as we're criticizing it, like, I mean, if, if, if I watched all six episodes and came away with nothing but that piece of information, mm-hmm. I, 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 I find myself better educated and more aware and, and, uh, of the world as a result of that. And for that alone, I, I would give this show kudos and say thank you. I assume that nobody liked the epilogue where Edith is being, having her mind uploaded, or I don't, maybe, um, did anyone like that? Uh, <laughs> <Long silent. laughs> yeah. Eh. It made sense <laughs> yeah. narratively, I guess. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. a good way to wrap it up. Like, okay, this has all been in flashbacks telling the story, but it seems like they got to uploading very quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? it also, in that I mean, fifteen years. I mean, uh, I mean, pretty... it's it makes a certain amount of sense that since they jumped ahead in the prologue, they would jump ahead in the epilogue. But I think the problem with that is then she's. Like pretty much the last scene, the last extended scene is her talking to these two technicians that we 
never met before and mm -hmm. don't care about yeah. at all when there's like 20 other characters in the story mm -hmm. that um you know right we we, we sort of need closure with mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so yeah I, I totally checked out at that part mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it was certainly wasn't my favorite part of the show by any stretch. It, it, it didn't, it didn't, I didn't hate it, but, uh, I felt like it, it did some good, it had some good, uh, a sort of emotional resonance, uh, mm -hmm. at the end, yeah. but, um, but yeah, again, that kind of felt like one of those things where it was like, it, it seemed like if they had more time and they thought, and like, you know, they were thinking they were going to have more time to do the show, they, they could have ended it in, in a different way, but then that was like sort of a shortcut way to end it. Um, so, yeah, I didn't like it. I didn't like it for, 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 for that reason. But, um, and, and of course, uh, Dave, Dave and Geek Sky, Gal Geek Side of the Galaxy listeners know, uh, my, my opposition to, uh, the whole, uh, uh mind uploading thing. Uh, <laughs> I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Um, well, but at so, least they, they uh, acknowledge, they yeah. acknowledge that in the yeah. show. Yeah. Right. I know. I like that part. I like that part. Yeah. I read an, in an interview somewhere where that said that Davies had always planned for that to be the last scene. Oh really? Yes. Yeah. So the... chew on that one for a moment here, my friends. Hey. Yeah. He... Okay. okay. Everything about this show, according to the the stuff I was reading, says that he wrote he wrote it all up, and he's been planning to write it more or less like this for fifteen yeah. years. Yeah, that's what I yeah. read too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did see that he he had been right he'd been planning to write it for a long time. Yeah. So yeah, it's kind of strange that he could have had this in mind for so long, and then uh, you know, well, uh, the world just had to get shitty enough <laughs> for him to really finally lay yeah. it on the same backbone, you know. But I feel like this yeah, show is kind of walking this you know very fine line between realism and satire, and mm -hmm. I feel like yeah, toward the end it just gets and the the sort of unsuccessful satire is exemplified to me by the scene where the um you know the the mp that vivian rook replaces accidentally decapitates himself by walking into oh, the oh yeah yeah. Um, yeah that was that was kind of strange <laughs> it just seems tonally completely off from everything I, else yeah. i didn't going... buy it we all know not to step around a drone like that i mean like <laughs> seriously we know that now how would we not know that in like seven years i don't know <laughs> <laughs> It yeah, was gross, so, but I, I sort of <laughs> felt like this show got like as it went, it got more and more like the 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 Black Mirror um, mm -hmm. episode I mentioned that I was hoping that I sort of was sort of expecting it to and dreading mm -hmm. it to be. So, yeah, I, I wish there was some way it could have maintained that because it has such a concrete sense of reality for mm -hmm. so long. Yeah, and kind of loses it toward the end, which which is kind of too bad for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, Dave, I actually am pretty impressed that you were able to watch it all in one day because, uh, you know, I was watching it with my wife, Christy, and she, uh, she's, she's much more sensitive to these kinds of like, um, you know, sort of upsetting shows, like, you know, like, uh, you know, mostly dystopian stuff like Handmaid's Tale or like, you know, um, where, where the characters are getting beat down or, or the world is terrible. Uh, well, and, where and women are impervious. abused. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. and I mean, I'm, I'm pretty impervious to whatever we're watching. Um, and it's like Watchmen too, for instance, where it's like, just like really intense and, and like, you know, requires a you know, sort of high level of, uh, engagement. Uh, but, uh, so, it's like she couldn't take more than one episode a night, <laughs> you know, and it's like I wanted to I wanted to binge him, too, you know, but then it was like she she could only handle the one episode. So, yeah, yeah. Kudos to you for. Your well, yeah. And, and obviously there. I watch a lot of TV sh and I, I have yeah. to binge a lot of TV shows for this um, podcast, yeah. but I, I have not watched six hour long episodes in a row of anything else. Yeah. You know, that yeah. I can even think of for, for a long yeah. time. I mean, this this show and it was and it was. Like you're saying, it was very emo I, I, it was like an emotional roller coaster the whole mm -hmm. way. It, it wasn't, you know, I was in, um, and I just I was just physically tense, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. the whole time I was watching it, but in a in a good way. Yeah, I, I was in the same position. Yeah, I was I was very tense watching it. In fact, I I almost stopped watching it after the first one because I I just said I don't have the I don't have the emotional energy for this. You know, this is it turns out that this is a little this is really serious and it it it's it's really well done particularly the world building that you just can believe it and that was that was troubling and so yeah, yeah. I, I i did one a night because then by the next day i'd be like okay I've, I've got enough energy again to watch another episode mm -hmm. uh but yeah it was it, it took me some work actually i had that same experience i did watch the last two back to back because by that point i'm like okay i i need to see yeah. this through to the end and it yeah, was starting yeah. to turn and i kind of wanted to see where the turn would go 
but it's true. Like I would watch an episode and then I was like, I really want to watch the next. And then I'm like, no, I don't really want to watch the next. I want to like go out for a five mile run now and not think about anything. Mm -hmm. And, but then I'd sort of keep thinking about it. And yeah, then the next day I'd be ready to go again. So it definitely carried me along against my better judgment too. Well, and, and it has right? enough moments like the scene where they all get drunk and dance around in the backyard yes. or like yeah, yeah, where yeah. they go to the um, father's funeral and it's just kind of the sibling experience. <laughs> yeah. You know, that it, yeah. It, there, there, it, it's, there's enough scenes where it's just, this is life. This is what it's like to be human and to have emotions that, that's, that mm -hmm. aren't explicitly yeah. dystopian, that it, it's not just, you know, six straight hours of dystopian misery. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it has the texture. And and, up, and the ups and downs of real life. And there are even weird moments of beauty in the margins, right? And I'm thinking here especially about Lincoln, who I think is like all of oh, yeah. all of the great grandchildren are so underdeveloped. And I actually wanted episodes about all of them, mm -hmm. right? Like Lincoln, like he seems to float through life. Oh, my goodness. He's like he's mixed race. He's he's trans. Um and he's living in a council estate, so economically disadvantaged. And, like, we hear nothing about his story, but he seems to be doing okay. And it's like, mm -hmm. something doesn't suck in this world. Do you know what I mean? It was sort of interesting. Like, there seem to be these moments. Like, what happens to each of those kids? How do they survive? I also really enjoyed uh, that Celeste is, uh, you know, she's she's got the Caribbean background. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, speaking as a Caribbean uh, yeah. guy. And, and then uh, we had uh, Sharon uh, Duncan Brewster, the actress's friend, Baxter. She was a, a griot, mm. basically, uh, which I've never seen on kind of like a science fiction TV show. Uh, her, She's a professional storyteller, a griot. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. An activist. Uh, and she later becomes Edith's partner. And mm. that is like... Uh, that whole, that whole, I love that. I love that yeah. so much. Yeah. The coolest characters were in the margins, I think. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, actually, speaking of uh, Fran, the storyteller, though, like, when she tells her first story, like, in public, uh, and everybody's sitting around listening, mm. like, I was, like, wrapped by that. Like, I was like, I was like, I want to hear the rest of that story. Like, I want to hear, I want her to tell me stories all night. Like, uh, it's like, okay, let's just put years and years on pause. I just want to listen to her tell stories. Uh, like, th that was awesome. That that was one of my favorite moments. Like I was really kind of touched by that because mm -hmm. that the storytelling is really important. Um, yeah. Oral tradition is really important, and uh, you know, telling stories is 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 like telling stories to figure out who we are is so important. And so I felt that there was some there was that that was really cool. Mm -hmm. All right, well, so every. All right, so everyone, so there's uh, obviously there's a lot more we could say about this show, but uh, we're pretty much out of time and, and Lisa uh, has to go. So we are going to need to start wrapping this up. Um, but so let's uh, get a final thought from everyone. So, uh, so Lisa, any uh, final thoughts on Years and Years? Um, hmm, let's see, some final thoughts on it. It, oh my gosh, I don't even know what to say here yet. Can I, can I, can you come back to me? Go around. I'm thinking about it here. <laughs> All right, tag team, John. All right. Again. Uh, yeah. So like I, like I was saying, I, I just, I really, really love the, the show. Um, it, uh, yeah, it just, uh, I, I found it completely enthralling, uh, really, really believable world building. You know, we have our issues with the show, but yeah, it just, it just really accomplishes everything that like I want science fiction to accomplish. And, um, I, I'd love to see more shows, uh, attempt things like this. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, this has done this already and, and you don't want anything just like this, but I love, I love seeing something, uh, outside of books, uh, tackle these real contemporary issues that are going on in the world today and, and examining them through the science fiction lens instead of, uh, instead of only doing that in books. Whereas like, you know, almost all, you know, all science fiction that ta almost all science fiction that takes place in in you know television or film is is pretty you know pretty you know far future or or just so unrelated to the problems of actually today um and is often just about like visual effects spectacle um that uh that it ver has very real re very little re relevance to to you know these important issues and and so i just i would love to see more you know media science fiction tackle this kind of stuff Toby, final thoughts? This is a very meaty, well thought out uh, show that that tries to do a lot of world building and kind of looking at the consequences of uh, small things that happen now, you know, portrayed out into the future, which is one of my favorite things about science fiction, and while also examining the current state of our society. And and I think that is, you know, when science fiction holds up a mirror to us, that's when it's really can be very powerful. 
and at the same time it's it's very human it's got a lot of really powerful characters it uh tries to deal with some very big topics and sometimes it misses but i'm quite blown away by the fact that it was trying to do a lot of the things it was trying to do so mm. i was very captivated by it even when it wasn't working even when they fell down or made some mistakes um, with sort of, you know, the tragic gay romance or, uh, kind of the, you know, some, one of the aspects of how it tried to deal with transhumanism. Um, I felt that it was also trying to do those other things respectfully, um, you know, with Edith and, uh, Fran Baxter and with the, uh, one grandchild who is very, uh, interesting and, and trans and, uh, building a life of their own. So I, I felt that it was trying to do some things that you just don't see very often, and uh, I would love to see more media like this as well. And Lisa, final yeah. thought. All right, yes. So what all of you are saying, and in particular, I really appreciate that um, he chose to tell it through the the family lens. Um, I've done a lot of writing about the uses of, of domesticity in science fiction, and you know, you see, you saw a lot of domestic science fiction stories after World War II. It became a really useful way to talk about big issues like nuclear war and like a, a really radically transformed communication landscape, right? That when you have these big issues, one of the ways you, you make them manageable is to sort of explore them through the microcosm of a family or a domestic unit. And I think that that's really effective. And it's a great way to reach not just science fiction people, but people outside the genre who write always think that it's always like, you know, um, dashing young singles going off into outer space to fight bug-eyed monsters. Um, and, and I appreciate that this reminds us science fiction is a big tent and there's lots of ways to engage these big issues. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like I said, I mean, I, you know, I, I sort of had to motivate myself to watch this, but the moment I started watching it, I just couldn't stop. I watched the whole thing. And I, particularly the first four episodes, I would consider just absolute must-watch for any science fiction fan and particularly any science fiction writer in terms of an example of how to have well-drawn characters, you know, just very human seeming characters in a science fictional world. Uh, I think this is just a, a remarkable model of that, that everyone should, uh, should try to emulate. And all right, so we are all out of time. So we're going to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with John Joseph Adams, Tobias S. Bikel, and Lisa Yazik. So thanks everyone so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thanks. It's been a great time. Always good to be here. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to John Joseph Adams, Tobias S. Bikel, and Lisa Yazik for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution... You can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkertley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.